Okay, cool. So uh, we are going to start on our final panel of the day, which is going to be cracking the media awards. So everybody up here um, is connected to media awards in one way, or they won a significant amount of awards, or they uh, or they judge some of them, or they run the contests for our organization. Um, so we're going to have some great conversation on that. Uh, so. Let's start out with everybody kind of introducing themselves really quick on uh, who they are, and if you've won any awards, let's go ahead and hear it. <laughs> Come on, Master, you got it. All right, so Master Wheeler, um, I'm the one that's been sitting here for all morning, and voice going, who's that Master? The weird guy trying to show up. Um, uh, I am uh, the Plans, Policies, Readiness, and Training at CIC at NGB Public Affairs. Um, I think that's red, so that means we're not actually, um, I think that we are recording. You are recording. Good. Bummer. Um, I made, uh, uh, we'll leave that part out. Um, but I was the contest coordinator for uh, the Army and the Air Guard portions of the Keith Elware and the Air Force contest for the last two years um, uh, by myself there. Um, <laughs> so I deal with APAC, I deal with SAF PA um, when it comes to that stuff uh, that first about three months out of the year. Will Rainier, uh, back up here again. And <laughs> about where he's keen. No, no. I, don't, I really don't need it. Okay. Yeah. I think the battery just. All right, Vivo, you're on your own. Okay. Um, so, uh, 2000, I have so many. I, have to, I didn't make a list. <laughs> now, I do have some notes. Some things that, are, that I do want to put out. But, uh, so, in 2013, I was the Army's broadcast rising star. Um, in 2014, I won the Army Keith Aware for uh, video news report. Um, in 2015, we were deployed. In 16, I judged. I was a judge on the Forcecom uh, level uh, Keith Aware awards. And then uh, in 2017, I won the Army Keith Aware for audio entertainment program, and then the Defense Media Award for best post. Um, so kind of number like a good combination of, of video writing and judging, and so just trying to share kind of. What I, what's worked for me and what things that I've noticed across all the different combos. Jordan Fetter, um, I have won a few different at the major command level. Um, I think it started out in 2015. I was second place new writer for Pacific Air Forces uh, major command. And then um, the most recent one that was really big, so I won 2017 Air Force Writer of the Year. Um, and that, was, yeah, <laughs> that was my big one. So. Um, and then also transferring over to the guard, I just won news photo of the year for the air side. So um, those are my my main three. And then I've won a few other one at, uh, other ones at Air Force District of Washington um, for my photography and writing. Awesome. So um, this is for them two first. Um, so what would you? How did you start out? So like you you got out of the infos mm -hmm. and then speed once. Yeah. Uh, so I went to a brigade combat team and I showed up and there was another videographer already there and at this point they were really only supposed to have one per so uh, just because of the way like the G1 and S1 stuff works like they couldn't really move me without releasing me from the brigade and the uh, it just didn't happen so our brigade had two videographers and so in my first year he and I combined for like 90 video products between the two of us because we it was kind of one of the situations where they're like we don't know what to do with you and so he and I just got together and said, we're gonna make this place into our own AFN. And, and that's really what we did. Like every single week, we were just cranking stories out. And in the beginning, they really stunk. Like they were- about to ask, awesome. what, yeah. what was your first story like? So I, I did a joint, like a wing exchange between uh, US and Canadian paratroopers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really challenging because the lighting stunk and the audio was bad. And our commander, the brigade commander, was wearing unauthorized boots, so I couldn't use any of my shots with him in them. And so it was just like super frustrating. Like, And it turned out to be a really just crud product, totally. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Your turn. So I first went to Misawa Air Base, Japan. That was my first duty station, F-16s. And my very first story, I think, was for the uh, financial closeout, which was the most boring story I could have written. It was just the yearly one, and they were like, all right, you're just going to do the boring one, try and figure out writing. But then the, I think the first big one I wrote, they were... Um, <coughs> They were decommissioning the elephant cage, which was this giant antenna system that used to be used back during the Cold War or something. There were, there were a bunch of different um, ones across the 
across the United States and a few different military bases, and this was like the second to last one, and so I did that. There was a whole like ground, not well, not groundbreaking, but the opposite. Um, so that was the first big one for me. So. And I'm just gonna chime in on my worst story ever. So I, I always loved video. I've always been passionate about it. I got out of Dimfos and our unit, the first thing I covered was a brigade run. Uh, so everybody just lined up and did a giant run together. Um, I shot two hours of video, which I'm not exactly sure how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm still trying to figure out to this day how I shot two hours of people running. Um, so all, all that to say is when you, when you come fresh out of the schoolhouse, it kind of be in the, in the mindset or you come out of fresh, tra fresh out of training that what you learn there is a starting point. I think we're going to kind of touch on that uh, a little bit more. Um, so what, again, um, what motivated you to improve? Yes, yeah, so when I first started, there was a, a guy named uh, Robert Ham, Staff Sergeant Robert Ham at the time, who was in the Pacific, and he was just like doing these incredible videos. And there's one where uh, a group of uh, paratroopers started in Alaska, and they like flew over the Pacific and jumped into Australia, and it was just this like, I'm watching this video, but I'm like, oh my gosh, we can like tell stories this way, because I'm, I'm so used to that Dinfos mindset, like you know, soldiers conduct training. And a great time was had by all. And, and I see this video, and he's just got like all these different elements, and he's got cutaways of you know the wildlife, and you know just all these different aspects coming together. And I'm like, oh, like this is not a, a box for me to sit in. Like this is legitimately like, teaching the fundamentals of videography and or photography. And, and like we have to remember that that's all Dimfos. Dimfos is playing to the lowest common denominator. They are, how do we get a skill level one force out that is capable of, of shooting good enough video and telling good enough stories? And then really, like, we have to take it upon ourselves to elevate that one step further and say, okay, <clears throat> what, what do I really want to do here? And how do I use these fundamentals as a foundation and then really build up upon that? Yeah, mine was pretty similar. I had a, was a brand new NCO as a supervisor, and he was actually TDY most of the time before PCS, but I would just read his stories that he had published right before he was he went TDY to, I think he was doing training somewhere, but I would just read them. Uh, his name was Staff Sergeant Derek Van Horn, and he, he would do features, and there's something about the way he wrote his leads that like really hooked me and he would kind of set the tone for a story and just describe the scene of what, whatever he wanted to um, kind of describe for the, for, the rest of the, for the rest of the story. And so for the longest time I was doing the whole Dimpos thing is just the basic lead, this happened, this date, whatever. And there was one day that I was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna try it. Like I'm gonna try to do what he's been doing and just, just attempt it. You know, you get that fear, you're like, it's gonna turn out horrible, it's gonna sound dramatic. And it's like, all right, I was like, I'm just gonna do it. And I wrote it out and turned it into, who was kind of standing in as my supervisor at the time, and she's like, where did you learn this? And she like couldn't couldn't believe that I had just tried tried something brand new without anybody telling me. And so that was that was how I kind of got into writing, was feeling feeling really good about the story I was trying to tell and not just checking a box. Yeah. And kind of just to continue that story, because it's very similar, I feel like, just having a, a leader, a senior NCO, or someone like look at at you know your product and say, oh, like you really like you, you kind of have something going on here, like, and then from there they really start to realize, hey, there's a little bit of talent, and then they start to like cultivate it and provide opportunities, and you know you just take advantage of those opportunities as they come, and so that that would be my biggest like point. If you have a young soldier or somebody who you see that talent in, like pour as many opportunities, like make them almost uncomfortable with opportunity um, and like really see, like allow them to kind of spread their wings and see what you can get out of them. So I have a question for, for you. No. What he said. No, 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 this was for you. <laughs> so this one is, what are some of the most, you know, and then everyone can go down the line, is what are some like standout things that you've seen on the military side? Mm -hmm. Why did they stand out to you? Like why do you remember them? All years of judging, there's got to be a couple of years ago that I that. Um. It's going to sound kind of sarcastic, but a well-sequenced piece of video. I mean, sequencing, after the last two years, I, I, I've come to think the sequencing no longer exists. Um, 
three shot sequences of basic telling of the story, all the angles. Um, if I see one, of, I hate to say this, but at this point, if I see one, it stands out because it's they're so rare nowadays. And that came down also as well from the higher levels from Keith Elware for the last couple of years as guidance is this, and, and from the Air Force for that matter, uh, they want to see sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, so that stands out because um, it tells the story, it tells the different angles. Um, too much do we see uh, now? Um, it just a, seems like a bunch of B-roll clips, you know, a bunch of medium and wide shots thrown together, and you know, there's a transition here and there, and maybe some music on their line, and, you know, whatever. But and then it, that that's been passing as being telling the story. Um, so, I really enjoy um, good story development, um, and so you know, you kind of like, oh, what does that mean? I actually have like deconstructed a number of stories and and come up with a uh, like a template almost. So. Um, I think you, if you guys want to write this down, this is like, this is actually how I, how I develop the story. So you set the scene, so whatever that is, um, we'll use a, a day at the range, for example. So, you know, you have your wide shot and you hear, like, bang, 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 like, and so immediately the viewer knows, okay, this is a story about the range. So set the scene. Um, and then you have to introduce the character. And so that can be um, the person at the ammo handler detail, that can be a person, you know, a new soldier who has to qualify, um, but you need, you need, every good story has a character, somebody you can root for or against. And that character has to have a, uh, a problem. And I, I would say a problem, like, it's not always as serious, like, you know, we say like not every kid can have cancer. Like, you know, there ha but there has to be some kind of conflict in that character's life. So using the range one, you know, he has to, he has to qualify on his on his weapon. Maybe it's the first time he's ever fired. Maybe it's a new weapon, and you can kind of tie in like a modernization spin, uh, or you know they're testing something out. Uh, but he has to have conflict, and that conflict has to change the character. So how does the conflict change that character? How do they grow? What do they learn? And what's different? And then uh, at the end of it, you have some kind of resolution. So either the character overcomes that conflict, or you know they live to fight another day, or that conflict is you know so severe that he had to call a buddy in and they tackled it together. Uh, but you have to have some kind of resolution. So seeing a, a good logical story progression where you're brought into the environment, um, you meet somebody that you care about and they have a problem and that bothers you, and then you see how they learn and grow and you feel good for them and they overcome it. Um, I think just good story development like that really like really helps somebody uh, relate to your story. Thank you. I'm trying to write science fiction. <laughs> so there's one story in particular that that's always stood out to me, and it was from that supervisor I had that I kind of tried to emulate for a little while, and he he had the opportunity to write about a first sergeant who was at the at the unit I was at at the time who was sexually assaulted when he was a kid. And it talked about his journey through to the military and partially how the military helped him, but uh, other other parts of his life and how he's, how he's grown and all, all these different aspects of his, of his life. Um, and he, he included that with a few photos of, of this, uh, this master sergeant with, with this tattoo on his back. And it just, like everything about the way it was written, the, the story, the depth, um, every piece of information he was able to include in this. It was just, it, it really hit me that, that he was even, even able to get this information. That, to me, is a really good storyteller, somebody who's able to ask the tough questions and, and develop that. But it also shows the vulnerability of the, of the master sergeant who shared his story. So to me, just as a whole, that was just a, a beautiful piece. So. Can I change my answer? <laughs> um, so you senior NCOs taking credit for all our work. <laughs> so one thing that you know I didn't understand at the time, and we've all pretty much all been to Dimphos at some point. For those of you that don't know, Dimphos is where we all have to go to Fort Meade at some point uh, and learn how to do our craft. Um, and I never really understood it, but it's when they said finding your voice, you will find your voice. Once you get out there, you'll do it. Um, and I never really understood what that meant because when you leave, you're kind of like, well, you just you told me everything that I have to do. How could I possibly, um, I could possibly find my voice? But you brought up sequencing and like looking, looking back on what I think us, we've all just said is that there's somebody at some point who has done something with the basics that had an impact on us that wowed us in a way that mm -hmm. 
we didn't think was possible or that we didn't see before. And we sat there and then we said, I'm going to do that. Um, and I can tell you just from my experience, I look at videos, photos, articles, whatever that I enjoy on my off time, and I go, okay, how can I emulate that in this? Right. Um, and the same thing applies, I think, on and off duty, especially for us, like when we're, when we're watching TV or when we're on our phones, what are you stopping and looking at? Um, and then how do you emulate that? But um, one thing that I wanted to sort of, um, sort of ask you, was when you're looking at the awards, um, and y'all can, can chime in on this too, um, to, 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 to multiple part question. What things do you see that uh, impact the awardees in a negative way? And then what were some things that you all saw in your previous entries, or maybe you didn't get first place the first time? Like sure. what, what, what were the things that you improved on? Mm -hmm. So, uh, for me, is for the awards is, is the coordinator. Last year, I did more judging, at least on the video side, some of the photos. But this year, I was primarily the administrator. So I had to look at it kind of black and white. I had to look at it either met the qualification standards, the criteria, or it did not. And then make the determination sometimes where it was kind of gray, you know, am I interpreting the rules a certain way so then I reach out to APAC or whoever and say, hey, well, what do you guys think about this scenario? Does it need it? Does it not? And sometimes they surprise me and said, oh, no, it's fine. Put it forward. And I'd be like, oh, I would have disqualified. But okay. Um, so that's the way I had to look at it this year was that, you know, because in the end, um, I have to send some things forward that I know or I'm reasonably sure will not get disqualified at the next level. So sometimes that meant me having to take something that was really, really good, and I saw a lot of good work, but it, it either it, it lacked something in the criteria or it violated a rule that I had to disqualify it, which for someone who lacks empathy and has no real heart, it's <laughs> very difficult for me because it tears at you like, I gotta disqualify this, it's a great piece of video. And my next runner-up isn't bad, but I know it's not going to win, but it won't get disqualified. So uh, I know that I don't know if the question necessarily no, answers your answer, answer yeah. but I, I got to tell you, it, it, the frustration you guys, I want, the one thing I want to do, the frustration you guys feel, and I, I, and I have apologies for the state guard folks, because we don't really include you guys in, in, in the, that level of the competition. Um, we don't just sit there and go disqualify, you know, qualify, disqualify. We, we look at those products. We look at every single entry. My first thing I do is to go through and get rid of the stuff that I know right off the bat from the metadata rank. Um, you know, Air Force is a perfect example. If you're an E7 or above in the Air Force basic, basic categories, it's disqualified. I'm not sure if it's No, and, and well, yeah, if you're a GS11 and below. So, and then depending on if the byline said their rank or said their civilian status, that we got a lot of stuff about that, that that we have to still work out with the DMA folks. But it killed me to see that there were a lot of really good work out there that we couldn't send forward because I knew that the, the folks up there at the higher level were going to look at it just straight up, black or white. It either meets it or it doesn't. And um, we own this contest as, as a as a service or services um, and, and we all own portions of the responsibility for that contest so we all have to uphold that so that means that the you know the, the submitters have to take ownership and do their part along with everybody else along the line so it really kills me to get rid of stuff that we you know that I know is a great piece yeah I think um, when I, when I was younger and a little bit more, a little bit less humble, I guess is the best way to put it. I, I wanted to be, I wanted my products to be the best. Like I had, you know, peers across the division and, you know, you blame it on this, this patch on this side. Like I had peers across the division, I wanted to be better than, I wanted to be better than them. And so this, you know, when you start looking at competitions, you think to yourself like, oh, if I win this competition, I will be better than them. 
totally misguided line of thought. But you know, that's how twenty, you know, twenty. Told you there were egos in the room. Yeah, <laughs> see, and it, it's, fair, it's fair. real. It is very real. And so, you know, I, I looked at the, I looked at, you know, we're going to get on this, but I legitimately looked at the SOP and said, okay, like, what do I need to do to win this category? Uh, what are, you know, what, how, and I would take that into consideration when I'm planning my shoots and I would shoot to the category. If I knew, especially if I knew something was going to be like a good story, like, a, like I had a real juicy, like lead on a documentary or something like a really good feature, I would go and look and say, okay, what are the, what are the requirements for feature story or news report? And I would almost like shoot to the, the requirements. For that reason right there, because I knew if, if it didn't meet certain criteria, it would never get judged no matter how good of a product it was. So if, it, if, it's, something, if it's something you want to push your, your soldiers, your airmen to, uh, if it's something you want to encourage them in, like start start the SOP. To, not to sound even more sneaky, but I would actually go back and look at what categories either had no entries or just one. Mm -hmm. And, oh, the, and then whenever whenever my my boss or whatever was like, hey, you need to go cover so and so this, I would say, anything specific? Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, no, nah, no, nah, just go cover. And be like, all right, a <laughs> video series it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so like they don't care. And so when you're when you're going through there and you look like reverse engineer that SP, yeah. like you said, like mm -hmm. go in there and say, hey, nobody submitted for audio story last year. Nobody submits for audio. If you're looking for an easy win, there it is. <laughs> we got like two army submissions for audio report this year. Two. That's it. Now, 50 states. It's plus 10 for us. Us and Forest Comp, the National Guard and Forest Comp are, are direct reporting units. We get three, submissi or three submissions to Keith Delaware every year, our top three. But we control by far 90% of the career field, probably I mean, 80 to 90%. All the SRC 45, all the MPADS, PADS, the divisions, the brigades, the you know, all that stuff. We control that between those two direct reporting units. So we kind of get hosed when it comes to the number of votes. We should get more votes. Mm -hmm. You should treat it more like it's like a Congress or something like that. We have <laughs> some representation or whatever based on population, but we don't. So we have to fight, you know, for every inch. And we have to make sure we're putting forward the best products to compete with the rest of those jokers because you know who knows what they're putting out. The so Jordan, though, what did you have? Did you have anything that was like? So I, I haven't ever judged any any media awards, but the very first year I was eligible, I wrote a just a, a feature series because the previous year I'd seen that was a category I'm super excited. I, uh, there was basically the story kind of laid out for me because they were already doing an event about it on base. So I wrote out this whole piece. I was super excited to submit it. Then they changed the uh, actual awards, that, the categories at the end of the year, and they took out series. And so at that moment, I was just like, you know, I don't, I don't really care about winning anymore. Like that, that changed my perspective. I was like, I, I. I'm not even going to look at what the requirements are until the last minute. In a lot of ways, that, that's not great because you end up scrambling for a story. But like when I when I won the writer of the year, I didn't I didn't even look at what the requirements were until I was about to submit, and I happened to have like the, the two feature, the one news, the I forget what the other the other two were. But I I just had them because I just made sure to write about as much as I could during that year. So. I just I've had a different experience where it's just I've, I've produced what I produced and if it happens to meet a category I've submitted it but I think it can go either way. I love this. The next question is um, <laughs> so going back so like I guess we could all say like but that's interesting though that you, that you brought that up because I always thought that everybody that my way I would say probably your way which is we reverse engineer it but you're saying that. You actually chose topics that are that you were kind of, you're doing it the pure way, which is like you're, <laughs> you're, you're picking I'm things that you really wanted to see a story <laughs> about, and then you know, we're like, can I even go here? Like, <laughs> but but she's saying, but it's following that, it's following the heart of what we do. It's following, it's telling the story to the best of your ability, and then seeing how that fits into those categories. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I will say that um, I think the cool thing about the awards thing. And Really, if you really do, whether you do it that way or you do it uh, the, the, our way, is it actually forces you to do something different, and you will be shocked at how much fun different can be. It's not as scary as you actually think it is. 
Uh, I think a lot of times we might be a little bit scared of failure, uh, of not producing the right product, or maybe maybe not fulfilling what we were supposed to do to begin with, or somebody getting upset at us. But I think you may be surprised with yourself in that. Um, so with that, um, what would you say uh, has been your favorite category that you've judged uh, and that you've ever submitted for? Your favorite and, and worst? Ooh, yeah, sure. Let's do your favorite and least favorite. So. <laughs> um, my favorite. I like video series. I like to see something, you know, I like to see, um, you know, that built different parts and then from start to finish, so like four. And because I think it, you can develop it yeah. much, you can go a lot deeper um, into it, into a subject or, or you know, some, uh, an event or whatever. And, and, you can develop it a lot farther. I just think it's more interesting. I like those the most. The, my least favorite is um, is documentation stuff like like B-roll. Um, unless there's a purpose behind it, I don't really miss. And, and I'm not popular on this belief. I don't believe we should give awards for B-roll unless it meets certain criteria, which is not listed in the uh, SOP. Which is, as an editor, from an editing standpoint, does the B-roll meet an editor's needs? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, if you're creating a news report, if you're working at AFN or whatever, you're creating a news report. And we're on the civilian side, civilians know well too, you have a photog and then you have the talent. And a lot of times, the photog's putting that stuff together for the talent. And then they're getting in 10 minutes before the you know, run time and air, you know, show time, and, and they're putting their voice in front of it. Um, I don't think it truly measures up. It has to have a meaning. The whole contest has to meet certain, has to, has to have a meaning. Has to, there has to be something behind it. No. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so ju just in general, I really like writing feature stories. So that's that's always fun to submit to. And it, in some ways, it's kind of fun to see who wins at the end of it too, because you're like, who got the juicier story? So <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I'm not always upset. I'm just like, oh wow, they found this incredible person to write a story about, and I just didn't get that opportunity. But um, I've always always liked to see who, who's submitting to what, and then how how my my work measures up. So yeah. Um. My, I guess the favorite one that, that I, I've kind of submitted in one for was uh, when I wrote the blog post, um, it, it was more than just like, hey, what can I blog about? Uh, it was like, it was really personal because I wrote about my experience uh, with a, our special operations mountaineering team. And so we went up into the mountains for a seven day trip and, and it was kind of day on, day off and we were just climbing for the entire week. Um, but one of the nights we were there, we noticed there were a lot of rescue helicopters in the neighborhood um, in the neighborhood, in the in the mountain range that we were at, and uh, at like nine or ten o'clock at night, we got a call from the county sheriff who said that they there was a hiker that had died, and mm -hmm. that the volunteer search and rescue team found him, but they couldn't get him out um, uh, because it was dark and they were gonna have to make camp, and they asked if we would go up and help, and so. Uh, you know, you got all these green berets who are like kidding up and getting ready to go into the mountains and save body, and they're looking like, "Will get your stuff? You're coming with us." And it was just like a really cool experience because it was kind of like a like, "Hey, we trust you to come with us." And so um, the entire purpose of the blog post was to say, "Hey, if you don't build this trust with the people that you're covering, they will not include you when something like that happens." And so you know, by going up and like climbing with them and just being next to these guys every day, like training, doing the same training they were doing, being there, I established a relationship with the people that I was covering. So when this really interesting opportunity happened, they were very quick to be like, yep, yeah, we know this guy, we're gonna bring him with us. And so it was almost a call out to public affairs NCOs across the entire <laughs> force that, hey, you have to be there training. You have to be you know, digging ditches or loading rounds or climbing mountains. And if you're not doing that, then they're not gonna trust you and, and they're not gonna include you in on stuff. So that, that was my favorite because it was just personal. Um, my least favorite ones are definitely the, I, I don't like the photo categories. I think they're, it's so <laughs> subjective. And there's like, if they're, and it's like politics and egos coming to play, worse egos than mine, uh, coming to play with the like photo. And like every year it seems like there's some kind of controversy around the photo. Like, just, oh, like my photo was so good. Okay, I'm sorry it didn't win. But it was so good. I'm sorry it didn't win. So my wife's into horses and they have these things called color classes where basically 
you know, we have Pintos, you know, all these different horses. I, I just pay for the horses. I, I don't care about the rest of the crap, but I pay for them. And so I, I laugh every time we go to these horse shows because, you know, the judge basically, it's, it's that. It's very subjective. I like that one over there because it's really cute. No, I like that one because it's really cute. That's, I see where you're going. <laughs> totally see where you're coming from. That. All right, so really quick, let's go down the line. Uh, two things you would recommend to someone who wants to better themselves in better themselves. I, I will tell you practical things you can do to just be competitive. Like you were saying, you know, so in some cases it really does come down to not, not the best one will win because of the criteria. So um, I would take that SOP and dissect that paragraph and pull it in bullet format and create a little checklist. And that way, especially for those of the year categories who require three or four or five elements that everybody's confused about because you can, <laughs> you can do this one, but if you do this one, you can't post it in this one. And then there's like, create a checklist. So that you can go, yes, it has a feature. Yes, it has a news. Yes, it has that. Yes, it's you know, whatever. Because I'll tell you, nine times out of 10 when we could disqualify something, it's because it did not meet the criteria. And we scrutinize it. Yeah, no, jo no joke. One of my soldiers wrote a really great story about a, a battle in Afghanistan where a guy was awarded a silver star afterward, and it was just this incredibly compelling story, like Black Hawk Down type, like power and energy in it. And but the whole crux of the story was, you know, the awarding of this silver star, which is you know not common. And so, you know, the the lead essentially was like soldier is awarded silver star, and like that's a news lead. And but so we submitted it in the news category because the soldier wins, you know, is awarded the silver star and here's the story and it's super powerful. But they they came back and they're like, you know, they picked their winner and we read the winner like, that's not, that's nowhere near as good as, so we call them, you know, because they'll call and say, why didn't we win? And, <laughs> and so we called our, our midcom and we're like, hey, like we just want to know like what happened. Like we, you know, if it, What's the deal? And they said, well, the lead, it wasn't a news lead. The first line was not a news lead. And we're like, what do you mean? Like, the first line, it says in the SOP, you know, must have a news lead. And so they wanted to see, you know, Sergeant First Class Paul Wall was awarded the Silver Star during a ceremony at Fort Carson on October 1st as the first line. And because it didn't have that, it didn't matter how good the rest of the story was, it, it didn't qualify for the category. So when we, when we say like, you know, not just dissect and make bullet points, like make sure that, you know, your, whatever you're putting forward really fits the category. And the other thing I would say is, so for my year as a judge, administrative data. Um, if, oh if they're making you do the paper forms or they're making you do this, how are they, like just put your administrative data in there correctly and like make sure it's formatted and make sure you're not using all lowercase letters and just make it professional because that is like, that's part of the judging process. Um, how well can this person follow directions? Like you, you know, everything that you're doing, you're being evaluated, especially in a competition like this. So a quick add on to that. Um, in the criteria, or in the SOP, which is in some cases 40 some odd pages, how many people saw in there that it says it must meet your commander's strategic communications? Um, plan, guidance, or whatever. Not too many, huh? So when you're writing feature stories, if you're writing whatever stories, it has to have that those messages in there too. It has to meet the command strategic communications guidance. If it's not, theoretically, you disqualify, no matter how good it is. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there um, that you really need to read. And I see it all, okay, because when I go into divots, I can see we have this little tab called history. And I can see who added what, when, who uploaded what, when, who did what. Hell, I can tell you what the services picked as winners. I'm just not allowed to say anything at the time. Um, because I have, I have these God-like um, like, um, permissions, which the DMA gave me, and I don't think they realized that was a mistake. So I can see a lot of stuff. Um, so I see when someone will post something um, December 31st at like 11.58 p.m., but they shot it in October. And I'm sitting there going, well, if it meant the command strategic or any public affairs, whatever reason, wouldn't they have published it back in October? So that tells me that person's submitting strictly for the contest, right? Now, 
depending on how you feel about that, I can tell you how I feel about that. I call it BS because it doesn't meet the beginning of the criteria that says we must meet the commander's strategic communications campaigns. It wasn't very useful, it wasn't timely, it wasn't relevant, it doesn't mean any of those things you're taught at Infos. So if you don't think we're seeing that kind of stuff, Sergeant Miller sees it. <laughs> and Sergeant Miller voices his opinion on it too. <laughs> because I have to spend three months of my life devoted to the media contest. And it doesn't stop when the judging is done. Because I get the phone calls going, hey, mine, mine so took first place. So and so's took third place, but in Keith L. Ware, his beat mine. How's that work? I said, because I submitted the top three like I'm allowed to by the SOP. And so the judges at Keith L. Ware said, his was better than yours. Remember? Horse, horse show. Subjective. So keep, keep in mind, you know, that kind of stuff, that we do see that kind of stuff, that it does read that bottom line in all the feedback from both the Keith L. Ware, my judges, the Keith L. Ware judges, the Air Force judges, and big capital letters on the Air Force feedback was read the SOP and I would put a times 10 after that <laughs> don't throw things against the wall and hope it sticks because you make my life hard <laughs> not to be selfish but if you make my life hard I'm less amicable to, to, to push for it with higher if, if they say something weird or whatever okay we have to take ownership of this it's owned by all of us, from the submitter to the commands all the way up through. If you don't care about it, why should I? She couldn't be honest with you. Why should I put all that effort? Because if you don't realize it, I spend not just three months, but I spend like 12, 16 hours a day, seven days a week for three months doing this. That's the one person you have. So please <laughs> give a crap about it from the start. <laughs> Sure, what do you have to say about this? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I told you you can't let me talk if you're ran. You're next. Sorry. So uh, most of my advice kind of bypasses the technical stuff. Um, I think I, I'm a naturally attention or like oriented on attention to detail. So kind of that stuff comes along with, with just what I'm writing. Kind of just, I, I, I guess I figure out this would be afterwards. But when it comes to actually writing and producing good content, which is I, I think what's truly won, won me my awards, is I, I take every opportunity I can um, to, to produce a, a story or take photographs. I, I'm not one to complain or, or make a big fuss over being having to go t on a shoot on a Saturday or something. Like I, I'll, I'll do the work and I'll, I'll take the opportunity as a potential for growth. And that's just something where if, if you show up and you truly invest yourself in the project and, and you convince yourself that you care because sometimes you don't you don't initially care but you, you convince yourself that this is something worth writing about um, then then you can really produce great content and it, it reflects because if you don't if you don't care I, I read so many so many stories by airmen either underneath me or across the Air Force where you can tell they don't care they make typos they there's nothing in there about about what actually matters they just checked a box and you're not going to win an award that way so that, that's just something I've always done. Even if it's not something I would normally care about, you, you just have to put yourself in that mindset and, and you grow from it and you end up using those skills toward, towards other things that you really care about in the future. So, yeah. yeah. One of the best photo series I ever saw was from a change of command, which is interesting because changes of command, they happen all the time and we always get sent out to do photos on them. Um, but this particular photo series, the, the photographer went to the commander's home the morning of and they got like, the photo of like the wife like helping him fix his tie and like just really intimate candid stuff um, and so it wasn't just the here's the guide on like yeah and so they you could tell they took something that was so routine that we do so many times a year and they like they cared and they cared enough to like tell that story in a different way that like nobody had ever really seen before and it's just like I think that's probably one of the reasons why it did so well because it was like everybody who saw it realized like this was a change of command that happened, you know, a dozen times, and this person actually like took the time to do to figure out a new way to tell it, and it was really powerful. And, and that's the thing. I don't mean to sound like I spend like three months of my time and I can never get it back, you know, <laughs> which I can't. No. But, but I care because I see so much really great product throughout the 54, not just in Texas, not just whatever. There's so much great product that if they just, you know, if going that little extra with it, we, we, we have it, I mean, the contest would be awesome. 
I mean, we, we'd be winning every time. We, we win, typically, a lot. The Air Force, we had a kind of rough year this year. The Army, we did really well. We did well last year and the year prior to that. You know, so even just, you know, discounting what we own of the career field, um, we did awesome um, for what we, especially, you know, for what we do and, and we're doing it part-time. I mean, really, if you think about it. So it just, it just burns me when I see stuff that, you know, that I know someone just, did, like she said, you know, just check the lock, just check the lock. Yes, is there any possibility, like, <laughs> tomorrow, if you guys are able to dig up the links that you, have, you guys have in the archives, see, see it do that? What we'll do is, because um, they're, uh, not sorry, Wheeler will be here tomorrow, but, um, I'll send you a link. Yeah, they'll, they'll send us some links, and what we're going to do at the end of all this, um, and we'll, we'll jump into closing remarks here in a minute. But we'll, we're going to compile all this. We're going to take all this information. Uh, we're going to send the links out to the playlists so you can go back, watch it, share it with the people that weren't here. Um, but we'll get all that info. And, and we'll, um, if y'all are fine with attaching your uh, professional emails with it, I would love to. I have my cell phone if you want to. So <laughs> if I answer it, leave a message. <laughs> um, leave a message is not important enough for me to recall or call you back. There's one, there's one thing that I did want to uh, point out. Upload it to divots first. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not with the new rules. It's not on divots. It's not on divots. So what happens? So just some side notes. Um, <coughs> since I have access to the feedback of went to the regimental sergeant major who controls the contest, by the way, and so does Chief Cook for the air. Well, Chief now it's, it's a new one, but the chiefs, the career field, and whatever you want to call it, um, control these contests. So divots isn't going away. Okay, you can hate it. The rank restrictions aren't going away. It's, it is what it is. Read your personnel guidance that says what each rank is supposed to do. They're really not concerned with the reality of things. Um, but certain, you know, sorry, but blog post is probably going away. Uh, audio I, I reports work. probably yeah. going away. <laughs> um, there's some, some works about merging some things. But my biggest takeaway is take that last year's SFP. Don't wait till like Air Force got screwed this year. Yes, they did. I said it. Screwed. <laughs> December 20th is when their SOP came out. Where are you on December 20th if you're yeah. active duty? Yeah. Leave. When do you open an SOP or an email when you're after, after J what J January 4th? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, they got hosed. Um, the Army's was better. It was out by October, early October. So there's no real use last year's SOP. Don't wait because. The, the categories themselves may go away, but if a news photo is a news photo, a feature photo, a feature photo, they are not going to change that much. It might change in verbiage to be for clarity's sake or whatever, but a news photo is a news photo. Right? So don't wait. Don't use that as a crutch or an excuse. Take last year's SOP and the year before that, see if there's any change, and use that to prepare your products. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, I was going to say, um, when you were talking about news writing, um, Sometimes when you write a story, um, it's just to fill the block. But if you remember your DINFOS training and you fill all the requirements, all the criteria for a story, and have a little bit of fun with it, just because it's kind of a little bit different, a little bit out of the ordinary, um, it can be a winner. Um, just, just kind of a, an instance, um, our uh, recruiters got their, their cars wrapped, you know, the, the wrappings on the cars. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. So I went out and I did a little story out of the recruiter, got the wrap, and then, and then took their cars out to the lake and took photos of the cars and everything. And, and it was a, just a, I don't know, maybe 500 words, something like that. I want Air Force level. And I was like, what the freak? I said, why did nobody else win? I said, did anybody else uh, even submit? Because it was just this news story about recruiters' cars getting wrapped. Mm. Big deal, but you know what? It fulfilled all the requirements. It was done right. The grammatics were correct. The grammar was correct. The you know the no Oxford commas. The, so sometimes when you just follow those basic rules and and you put that little bit of extra into it, not the fluff, but the little bit of extra, yep. you, you you blow it out of the water without even trying. So just knowing your job and doing it right and doing it well. Sometimes you're just going to blow them away without yeah. even trying. Exactly. Yeah. 
And that's something that um, I think once you have enough practice and experience, it's like you can you can knock out these stories that are so easy to read and digest, and that is so different from a lot of people who are writing. It sounds choppy, like it's not something you want to read. You read like into the second sentence, you're like, where is this going? And so it might be the same story, but it's like as long as you write it in a way that um, you, you know it sounds good. So for me, it's like putting together a puzzle. And so I'll like I'll put all the pieces in, and then I know if there's a piece missing, and then you're just like, okay, that's a good story, and like you, you just know once you have enough experience if it's if it's good or not. It's fun watching them do it because sometimes they'll go back and forth amongst themselves and go, you know, is this really a feature? Is this a new feature? Is this a feature? Is this whatever? And you sit there going. I'm not a judge this year. This is your problem to figure it out. <laughs> you know? and, have you seen uh, some middles that were in the format of uh, the program Adobe Sparks by any chance? Or in not. Adobe Sparks. I'm, yeah, I'm familiar with Sparks. Yeah. Yes, uh, so one of the things we expected to see was someone tried to submit 360 video. It okay. didn't happen, luckily. <laughs> um, yet. <laughs> but because it's a pain in the ass, excuse me, it's a pain in the butt to edit, I'm told. So therefore, it probably takes some smart folks to figure out how to do it really easily and then spread the word. And next, it'll be the next big thing. Um, drone footage is a big issue. Big issue. Big issue. Now I will tell you that the current guidance by DOD is as it is until, uh, you know, what is that? any CONUS, let, well, there, there's, there's, a, there's a DOD level revised policy that dictates that all the services have to create their own policy. And until those policies are created, <laughs> the memo that says you can't do it without a SECDEF ETP is in force. But the good news is, is what I've seen in, in written form, that it will allow public affairs to utilize them. It delegates the authority down to the 06 level or installation command level. However, there's another policy from the USPFNO, did I say that right, whatever, USPNFO, um, Title 10 folks, the money folks, that DJI is not authorized on your books. If you have it, get rid of it. It's a security issue because it's, <laughs> because it's a security vulnerabilities. <laughs> but, um, but people are using them, Texas. Uh, uh, so, in other states. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I get those phone calls that say, hey, I got this tenant who's got a drone and he wants to use it during this. Right now, OCONUS is open to whoever the command command allows to happen. There's no, there's no restrictions, and that's why you saw Staff Sergeant Runzer from Indiana submit drone footage and be roll because he shot it in Nigeria. Okay. When it comes to DISCA operations, it's a no-go. No drone footage, no drone usage from public affairs. State active duty, <laughs> it, I don't know what the SOP says about state active duty. <laughs> I know what it says about Title 10 and the National Guard. I think but we're gonna jump in and save you. <laughs> but, I, but I think we all know that if people were doing a little more the Texas way, <laughs> So, yes, we'll uh, we'll jump in there, uh, wrap up for today. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. A lot of interest. Thanks for spending the time helping kind of deconstruct that. Uh, that's it for today's portion. Tomorrow we're going to open up at 9 a.m. sharp. We're going to have uh, professional development officers, uh, both Army and Air, and then also um, the most as well. So we'll be back on back on the stage. Um, are there any questions for you today? A little bit of a social event tonight up at uh, Caroline's. Hope to see you guys there. Uh, but other than that, we'll see you guys in the morning, same bad time in January. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.